singing with me. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who is with us here today and directing everything we do today. You know, when, uh, when we look at the breakdown uh, in our culture, we actually are often quick to point the finger at Hollywood, to point the finger at the politicians in Washington, D.C., in our state capital, in our city, and even our schools. We're quick to point the finger. They do all play a role in it, in our cultural breakdown, but when God sees the breakdown of a nation, he doesn't point his finger at the government he points the finger at his people, the church. You know, in, in our prayer of the week, the one we recite every week, including today, the Second, Psalm, Second Chronicles uh, chapter 7, verses 14 and 15, you know, in it God, it, God says that then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will heal from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. Now, of course, we always gravitate to the last part of the verse, that part that says, talks about restoring our land. But notice the first part of the verse says, if my people, that means you, and that means me, that's when we, when God looks at a nation and looks at our cultural breakdown, yes, there are a lot of people that are so the fault of that, except God looks at his people. He says, if my people, who are called by my name, will uh, ask for forgiveness, will pray and seek my face, then... He will heal their sins and restore their land. Now, according to Scripture, according to that Scripture, that's the prescription for revival. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and restore their land. That's the prescription. For revival. Now, in Psalms 80, the one that uh, Gene read earlier, uh, that psalm actually contains a cry for revival. Uh, revival is, by way of a definition, revival is a sense of a special move of God's spirit. The move that uh, brings with it a deep conviction of sin a fresh holiness, a new zeal for God's word and God's glory. Revival is a special movement that may be as short as a few hours or as long as many years. And it may result in thousands being renewed and converted. Ultimately, revival leads to a kind of Penetration phrase where people are evangelized and social evils are confronted. In revival, you know, people are captured by Christ in such a way that they'll follow him. And as a result of that, the church is transformed. The church falls in love with Jesus again when there's a revival. So I want us to look at two verses in Psalm 80 as our text for the week. I'm going to look at verses 12 and 14. 12 and 14. I'm reading from the New King James Version, uh, verses 12 and 14 of Psalms 80. Why have you broken down her hedges so that all who pass by the way pluck her fruit? Return, we beseech thee, O God of hosts. 
look down from heaven and visit this vine. I want us to consider three words today that point to the need for revival. Those three words are hedges, hope, and heart. So in H, hedges, hope, and heart. So the first word is hedges. Now the purpose of a hedge, let's look at that. In the Bible, we find hedges around three things. We find hedges around a nation. We find hedges around a person. And we find hedges around a family. So first a nation. Look at, if you look at it, it's Ezekiel, write it down. Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 5. Ye have, and I'm reading this time from the King James Version. Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. That's the nation. And then let's look at uh, the hedge around a person and a family. We're going to look at Job. Job chapter 1, verse 10. I'm reading from the New King James Version this time. Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? Have you blessed the work of his hands and his possessions? You have blessed the work of his hands and have increased the land. So hedge around a nation, a nation, hedge around a person and a family. In the New Testament, Jesus prayed for Peter uh, and prayed for him. In effect, he was building a hedge of protection around him. Uh, you remember, you'll remember the time he prayed for Peter. It said Luke 22, 31, and 32. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you return to me, strengthen your brother. So Jesus was, in effect, building a hedge of protection around Peter. Jesus also prayed for protection for his disciples. And that includes us. If you look in, in uh, John chapter 17, verse 15, verse 11 and 15. John 17, verse 11, verses 11 and 15. If you remember, uh, John chapter 17, it's Jesus' prayer. He prays for himself. He prays for his disciples, those that are with him on earth. And he prays for those that would come after them that would believe, have faith, because of what they did. So in effect, he prayed for us. He prayed for himself, he prayed for his disciples, and he prayed for us. So John 17, 11, and 15. Now I am no longer in the world, but, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those you have given me, that they may be one as we are. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. God's hedge is his invisible wall of protection that he builds around a nation, around a person, around a family, around a church, or even around our possessions when we are obedient to him. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, because they provide a deep understanding of the kind of protection we as believers have. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and, uh, I'm going to actually read verses 3 through 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6, so we can see for the, the kind of protection that we believers have, the kind of hedge that God builds around us. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, 
bringing every thought into captivity through the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So that's the kind of protection that we have, the kind of protection we have from the hedge that God fills around believers. But the problem with hedges is that they can sometimes be torn down. Hedges can be broken down sometimes. If we go back to the scripture that Gene read, uh, Psalms 80, verses 12 and 13, the psalmist asks a question. Why have you broken down our hedges so that all who pass by the way pluck her fruit? The boar out of the woods uproots it, and the wild beast of the field devours it. So somehow the hedge of round Israel was demolished, and the nation was ravaged by enemies just like wild animals can tear up a field. Now today, enemies like wild animals are running throughout the world and the nation and even our neighborhoods. Now here in this nation, the United States, we've been suffering from a critical moral crisis for many years. We've been confronted with terrorism, street crime, domestic violence, alcohol and drug abuse, sexual immorality, the decay of marriage and the family. On top of that, we had a pandemic and a lot of stuff happened. Right, so wild animals are running rampant throughout the world. So the hedge around this nation has some holes in it. But there's more, there's more. There is spiritual illiteracy, there's apathy, there's irreverence, there's greed, there's pride. All of these are holes in our heads, and they threaten this nation. Something has happened. Our head is torn almost completely down. So the question is, who has broken down the head? Look at verse 12 of Psalm 80. What it says is that God is the one who did it. For, you know, to Israel, or he allowed it to happen. You know, as, I, as I've often said, God does not do bad or evil things, but he will sometimes allow it. Now, in my opinion, there are three reasons God has allowed the heads around this nation to be torn down or have holes in it. One, to bring judgment on his people. Two, to cause us to become spiritually vigilant, and three, to bring us to confession and repentance. So remember, the, the first reason was to bring judgment on his people. If you look at Isaiah chapter 5, verse 5, it says, And now... Please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. So much Israel, right? I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned, and break down its walls, and it shall be trampled on. I did that to bring judgment on his people. Look at us. He's allowed our heads to be broken and torn down to bring judgment on his people in this nation. Because God does not always shield us from the results of our own sin or the negative effect of other people's sin on us. God does not always shield us from that. Our world has fallen, and unfortunately, we have to endure its hardships. However, what we need to remember is God remains in control, and our sufferings 
do have a limit. So there's holes in our heads because God is bringing judgment or allowing judgment to happen on his people. Now, the second reason that, in my opinion, God has allowed our heads to be torn down is to awaken us to spiritual vigilance. Now, a vigilant Christian is someone who is fully conscious of the spiritual realities in their life with Christ, spiritual realities of their life in Christ. And they get the motivation and the strength for their life from Christ. A vigilant Christian does. A vigilant Christian is conscious always of the spiritual dangers from the enemy, from Satan and the world, and a spiritually vigilant Christian actively resists them. Right? It's a spiritual battle. It's spiritual warfare. Ephesians 6.12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness in this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. This is a spiritual battle. And the more vigilant we are, the more mindful we are, the more vigilant we will be when we understand and realize that we are in a spiritual battle. And uh, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we really wrestle against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness, against spiritual hosts of wickedness. It may come in the form of a person. It may come in the form of circumstance, but our battle is a spiritual battle, and uh, uh, the, the reason our heads just get holes in it sometimes is so that we can be more vigilant, spiritually vigilant. The more horizontal our perspective, where we look to people, to government, and to things, rather than a vertical perspective, where we look to God, the more our perspective is horizontal, rather than vertical, the more vulnerable we are. To be vigilant demands that we look, cast our eyes on God, that we understand that we're in a spiritual battle, and understanding that we will determine our decisions and our actions. So, our head just sometimes gets holes in it. Our head sometimes gets holes in it so that we can become spiritually vigilant. All right? So we got two reasons. One, be spiritually vigilant. The second reason, the other reason is to bring judgment. And the third reason, in my opinion, that God allows our heads to be torn down is to bring us to confession and Repentance. Genuine repentance is always accompanied by confession of specific sins. You know, the Holy Spirit doesn't give us vague feelings of guilt. He convicts us of specific, definite sins and shortcomings. So all confession should be specific, definite, and to the point. So when we confess our sin, just so say we confess our sins, be specific when you confess sin. The Holy Spirit is going to convict you of a specific sin, so confess a specific sin. The, the purpose of the convicting power of the Holy Spirit is to reveal our need for the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Confession does not earn God's forgiveness. It enables us to receive his forgiveness. Confession doesn't earn God's forgiveness. It enables us to receive his forgiveness. God does not love us more 
when we repent, our love is blessed. When we fail to repent, his love is constant. The only variable, God's love is constant. The only variable is our response to the working of the Holy Spirit. The only variable is our response when we're convicted of a specific sin. The truth is this. Our hearts are hindered from receiving the abundant blessings that God has for us while our spiritual arteries, I'm using that as an analogy, while our spiritual arteries are clogged with the sludge of sin. Sin deadens us to the Spirit's prompting, and it makes us harder to respond to him. Repentance and confession open the clogged channels of our spiritual hearts so that we can receive the overflowing of the Holy Spirit's presence and power in our lives. Repentance does not make God love us more. What it does is is that it enables us to appreciate his love more. I want to repeat that. Repentance does not make God love us more. What it does is it enables us to appreciate his love more. At the beginning, I said there were three words we were going to deal with. The first word was his. We talked about that, right? The second is hope. I said that our hedge, our hedge has big, gaping holes in it that God has allowed. So here's the question. Is there any hope that God will rebuild or repair the hedge? The answer is yes, if we understand how God builds a hedge. God builds a hedge through godly people. Job is our example of God building a head around a godly person. The first verse of Job says, there was a man in the land of laws of us whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. Job, now, was not without sin, but he was wholeheartedly devoted to pleasing God. He was upright in that all his relationships were right with God, with himself, and with others. Job feared God, honored God, and he avoided evil and turned away from evil. God built a kids around Job, that's why Satan could not harm Job until God allowed him, allowed Satan somehow to get around the head, or maybe the head was torn down. God allowed him. Okay, verse uh, 10 through 12 of Job 1. This is Satan saying this. Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hand, and his possessions have increased in the land. His possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person, so Satan went out from the presence of God. So then, after Satan took his best shot, Satan took his best shot at Job, God rebuilt the hedge around this godly man. Remember what I said? God builds a hedge around godly people. Look at what he did for Job. It's in the last chapter of Job, scroll 42. Verses 12 through 17. Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning, 
for he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters, and he called the name of the first Yememah, uh, the name of the second Keziah, the name of the third Korean Apuk. In all the land were found no women so beautiful as the daughters of Job, and their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and grandchildren for four generations, so Job died old and full of days. God rebuilt the hedge around Job. Number two, God builds a hedge through his word. If you look at uh, the 13th chapter of Ezekiel, and I encourage you to read that. In the 13th uh, chapter of Ezekiel, it talks about the word of God coming to Ezekiel against the false prophets. Ezekiel was speaking against the prophets of Israel who had not kept and maintained the hedge of God's word. I'll read just a couple of verses from Ezekiel 13, verses 1 through 3. And the word of God came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who prophesy and say, those who, and say to those who prophesy out of their own heart, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Woe to the foolish, foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. These false prophets didn't have the vision of the Lord gives to his true prophets. This example from Scripture teaches us that God builds a hedge through the preached word as inspired by the Holy Spirit. As a true and accurate word is preached, God can build a hedge of protection around a family, around a person, around a nation, around a church. The preached word of God can build a hedge. God also builds a hedge through prayer. Still in Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. God builds a hedge when his people engage in prayer, in intercessory prayer. When his people stand in the gap, God builds a hedge. God also always works in response to prayer. God builds a hedge of protection when we pray. Okay, I got one more word. We have hedges and hope. Heart was the final word. Now, when the psalmist, Asaph, Asaph is the psalmist that credited with, with writing Psalms 80. And when he realized what was happening to the heads of protection around Israel, he wrote this heart cry for renewal. In verse 14 of, chapter, of Psalm 80, Return, we beseech you, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see, and visit this vine. Asaph was saying, Lord, visit this nation. You've broken down the hedge that guarded our country, but we know you want to bless us again. Turn us to you. That's our heart's cry. The batteries, batteries may be weak. So that's our heart's cry. Lord, here's our heart's cry. Lord, visit your church. You created it. Your building, it belongs to you. It exists for your purpose. Today we cry for revival. Lord, visit our families. Many are suffering. We need help. Restore the hedge around us. Restore the hedge around our families. 
Visit our homes with revival. Visit our nation with revival. Visit our church with revival. Get our attention. We are being overcome with evil. Our protection is gone. Lord, visit our lives. Visit this vine. Let me tell you what can happen with revival. You know, on Wednesday, February 8th of this year, at Ashburn University in uh, Wilmore, Kentucky, a handful of students remained in the chapel following a regularly scheduled service. One student decided to openly confess some of his sins to a small group. That changed the atmosphere, and it became a revival. Now, this right revival, by the way, is significant because of its spread on social media. This is what God can do. This revival is, is significant because of its spread on social media, especially among Generation Z, which has been described as the most irreligious generation in U.S. history. Generation Z, Z or Gen Z is the generation born. So you know, generation born in the late 1990s or early 21st century, it's, and it's the generation that is perceived as being familiar with the use of digital technology, the Internet, and social media from an early age. Gen Z has been described as the most irreligious generation in U.S. history. But look what happens when God begins to reveal the hedge, the revival. On February, remember now, this started on February 8th, when one student opened and confessed a sin. On February 15th, the hashtag Asbury Revival had over 24 million views on TikTok. By February 18th, views had blown up to 63 million. This is what God can do when we're serious about revival. Remember what I said at the very beginning of this. What, what God says causes revival is if my people, his people, us, believers, humble ourselves and pray and seek his face when we confess our sins and we repent and we pray, then God will hear and restore and heal our land so we can point wherever we want to. And yes, there's evil in this world because it's a fallen world. There's evil everywhere. We can point everywhere. But God says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray. So revival starts with us. And it doesn't matter what church or denomination you're in. The revival I'm talking about that started at Asbury, uh, responses have been reported at other university campuses and is notably ecumenical. Methodist, Baptist, Episcopalians, Roman Catholics, everyone is participating in the spread of this revival. Look at what God can do. I'm going to end with this. So it's verse 14 of Psalms 80. Return, we beseech you, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and see and visit this fire. Stir up revival in us and let it begin with me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, restore our lives 
and help us to be re- be wise and to redeem this time. Thank you that you you will never waste our pain and our suffering, but you alone are able to turn it around for good. Thank you that nothing is impossible with you. The same power that broke prison chains, raised the dead, healed the sick, and parted the seas. That same power is at work today. Thank you, Father, for reminders that you are always with us, you always help us, and you haven't lost control even when things feel uncertain around us. All of your plans and purposes will prevail, for you alone are mighty. We believe and trust you to do extraordinary miracles in our lives, in our land, and in our world. Father, we need you more now than ever before. Our lives are in your hands. We love you, Lord. Visit this vine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, I cannot leave without inviting um, anyone who hears me or who's here today who have not accepted Jesus as the Lord and Savior. I've been talking about revival today. And one thing revival does is stirs up the church. It stirs up the Holy Spirit. And, and so what I'm... What I am urging you today, if you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm urging you today to consider this. Consider becoming a part of this revival. Consider, consider becoming a part of the family of God with all of its benefits. The greatest benefit being eternal life and presence eternally with God. I invite you to do that today. It's simple. Repent of your sins, confess first. Repent of your sins, ask God to forgive you, and he always will. God will always answer the prayer asking for forgiveness. Always, always, always. And then do this. It's in the scripture. It's in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart you are made right with God and openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Then verse 13 of that chapter says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Do that and then find a Bible believing Bible teaching church. This is a good one. Or find one. Find one if you can. I urge you to do this. We won't have a post due today, a musical post due today, uh, but we will have, for those of you that want to stay, we will have healing service down here in about, give me about five minutes after I pronounce the benediction. Come down here and we'll pray with you for healing and restoration. Heavenly Father, revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Okay, I'll see you in about five minutes. Give me time to get out of this mic, and I'll be back. I forgot to change (laughs) Bazzix.